Reporters for Vice News travel the world, putting a human face to the world's most important stories. There's a solid wall of riot police officers. But now we introduce you to them. They're doing CPR on one of the casualties here. We don't know if he's going to make it. This is Field Notes, a show that sits down with our reporters to find out the stories behind their stories and how they got so close to the action. Feeling pretty good about that? In this episode, we meet the team that spent months in Haiti before and after the country's president was assassinated and embedded with the police and gangs now fighting for control. Go, go, go! So these are the exact same forces that just a week ago were in a fierce gun battle with the people suspected of killing President Moise. We're heading to his presidential mansion right now. They're gonna take us there to show us uh, what went down. What does it say about a country when the president in his own home is killed? We are doing our best, but uh, it's not easy for us. This is not the army. But that kind of battle that that having place here is, I think it's, it's something that might be controlled by an army. That's what it would have taken. I think so. So Michael, uh, Jeremy, and Maya, thank you guys for joining me, both in person and virtually. This is uh, the kind of story we're talking about is a the assassination of a world leader. It's, it's just like, this is a gigantic news event that has a lot of mysterious elements to it. And you guys had done quite a bit of reporting in Haiti prior and then went back as this news unfolded. What was it like to be there for you, Michael? What did you find out? And as you landed on the ground, like, what were the questions that were formulating in your mind? You know, getting there was a challenge to begin with. I mean, as soon as, or shortly after the president was assassinated, the flight restrictions were put in place, nobody could get into the country, and so we were trying just to find a way to get in. Uh, Sam and I, the, the director of photography on the shoot, uh, flew to Miami and just waited. And we were waiting until they lifted those restrictions so we could get into the country mm -hmm. and figure out what was going on. Jeremy, our brilliant fixer, you know, he was able to, to get there via land over the Dominican Republic border. He was able to get into the country and start working and making those contacts on the grounds for us, uh, you know, so that we could have a, a good idea of where to start. Because, you know, so much happened in 48 hours. You know, the president was assassinated. All of these mercenaries were being arrested, not by the local police, but, but really by the locals there on the ground. They were the ones that were finding these guys and, and, and turning them over to the police. Um, and in those early days, things on the, on the street were relatively calm. I, 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 I wouldn't say calm in the sense that, you know, people uh, were, were, they didn't know what to do, but I, I think there was just like this tense, what happens now? What's gonna happen next? And very different from when we were there earlier this year. And, you know, there was, there was protests in the street calling for President Moise's ouster. Uh, you know, they wanted him gone and they got what they wanted, just not in the way I think a lot of them knew it was going to happen. Now, do me a favor and back up for a second and tell me about the circumstances that President Moise was assassinated under. How did it happen? Sure. What did you know going in? So what we knew going in is that, uh, you know, there, there was a group of people that broke into his mansion uh, in the Pechonville uh, neighborhood, which is a, a, you know, upper middle class neighborhood, uh, you know, in the, in the kind of mountainous region of uh, Port-au-Prince. And what we knew is that uh, his, his wife had survived the attack. He had been shot. He had been killed. Uh, we didn't know exactly what else happened to him. There was rumors going on that, you know, he was tortured and, you know, he had all these despicable things done to him and his body. Uh, afterwards, the uh, mercenaries that were, you know, that were there uh, escaped into the surrounding neighborhood and there was a, uh, the hunt was on. And police, uh, Haitian National Police and, and uh, you know, security forces were, were hunting down the people that were responsible for that. And in the beginning, that, that's all we knew. We didn't know who these guys were. Uh, we didn't know who was involved. And until today, the mastermind uh, behind all of this, police are saying that they're, they're still out there. And later it was revealed that some of these mercenaries were Colombian nationals, Colombian. that there yep. was an American, someone who lived in America right. of Haitian origin. Of the, of a, exactly. Who was potentially sort of the mastermind there. But yep. all these questions are swirling around. There's already 
quite a bit of social unrest in Haiti towards the president right. who, had, who then was assassinated. So you're kind of entering a place you've covered, but a place that is now in a totally different scenario. And that's the thing with Haiti is that it constantly changes every time, you know, something happens. I mean, you, you know, it's just, it, it's constantly evolving. You could say that really about any place in the world, but in Haiti in particular, I mean, the mood on the, it, w it was just completely different. Everything had changed and it had only been six months. And Maya, you guys got some pretty remarkable access by embedding with the Haitian National Police. And they took you right outside and I think inside, in, in a sense, the presidential mansion where he was actually killed. Uh, how did that come about, that access? What was it like to be there so quickly after the actual assassination? And what did you learn? Yeah, it was, it was pretty unexpected. It just came out of sort of constantly badgering the, uh, various police commissioners. Um, we definitely weren't expecting to get up so close. I'm not sure anyone else had but at that point. And it was pretty surreal. I mean, they led us straight up to what really felt like a totally you know, active crime scene. There were bullet holes in the wall and there were these cars with blown out um, windshields with, you know, with bullets and the FBI was roaming around. Um, Michael, you know, walks up to them and tried to talk to them, but they weren't having any of it. Um, and yeah, I mean, the police commissioner was sort of the person who was um, sort of expressing a lot of what we were feeling, weirdly. He sort of took us um, to this row of houses that was less than 100 yards, you know, from the presidential mansion and said, look how close this is. This is crazy. And then he took us onto the, onto the roof and he was pointing out, look how close, you know, this is a stone throw from the mansion. This is crazy. This is crazy. Um, and, you know, he's right. Like, obviously, you know, in, in the U.S., the White House, it's hard to think of a more secure building, right, where the president lives. In the in the UK, where I'm from, um, you know, the prime minister lives in a townhouse, but you need a, you know, paperwork to access Downing Street. Um, but in Haiti, it was completely, you know, the, this situation was, was the opposite end of that. Um, and so not only was there this sort of pretty crazy access, which you'd never imagine in the UK or the US, the police showing you this, but also just the level of security was 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 pretty flabbergasting. And, you know, the, and obviously the real issue that goes with that is that no one was injured during this night of, of the, the assassination, none of the guards or, or the police. Um, and when we when Michael questioned the, the commissioner about that, you know, he said, yeah, it's shameful what happened. And it brought shame upon the police, which were really strong words and we didn't really expect to hear from you know a police representative right and and michael i mean it's it's shameful but it's also a bit shady and it quite uh yeah it, it poses some questions about you know potential culpability effectively right if like well, certainly i mean uh, one of the things that the uh commissioner told us when we were standing on this roof looking at the president's mansion was that up on a ridge you could see that there was a guard tower mm -hmm. and he informed us that the night that the president was assassinated that guard tower was unmanned and you know now now he did caveat that by saying look i mean there's there's certain routines and but it just so happened that on the night that, you know, all these mercenaries essentially walk right in without much fanfare into the president's mansion, assassinate him. Nobody was guarding that guard tower. Uh, no, I mean, that looked, looked over the entire property. So this is, you know, this is something that you would just kind of laugh at. I mean, if it was, like Maya said, the White House, I mean, there's no way, you know, there's, there's snipers on the roof of the White House that are going to be looking down and, and, and seeing anyone hopping that, that front fence. Yeah. And that was quite a bit of reporting being there so soon that you guys learned, right? I mean, it yeah. was a bit of a news item that you were able to, to glean and to report out. And that answers haven't really been forthcoming since, have they? Like, no. I mean, we attended a couple press conferences and all of that was, you know, it was much to do about nothing. I mean, they would hold the press conferences, not really say much uh, about the investigation. They would talk about how they're, you know, they're forming uh, these committees, and these committees are going to decide what's going to happen uh, with the president's funeral. And you know, they're they're still, you know, looking to uh, to develop more committees to find out, you know, who's going to be investigating you know, certain areas of the, uh, the assassination. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, in those in those early days, there was. There was not much information coming out, uh, you know, from the from the party line. At the same time, I mean, the police commissioner was more than willing uh, 
uh, to tell us what his thoughts were on the on the uh, on the murder. Now, Jeremy, uh, you were able to get into Haiti a little earlier than the rest of the crew. I think a lot of the expectations about what the mood on the ground would be would have been chaotic, effectively. There was already so much social unrest prior to the assassination itself. A big event like this would uh, could potentially set off quite a bit of, of chaos on the streets. How do you sort of explain the lack of protests that followed the assassination, the relative calm that Michael told me? I remember we were we did a piece yeah, for we VNT chatting, that night. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the relative calm on the streets, was it shock? Was it national mourning? Like, what do you think, Jeremy? I, mean, I, I think the mood, uh, the mood on, on the street uh, is explained by, I mean, I mean, first everybody was a shock. It, it was, it was, it was very, it was like a big shock for, for everyone. Not, not only the fact that it, it happened and everybody sort of was thinking about how it was so easy to happen. And in you heard there was still mercenary at, at large. And also there was clearly like a this vacuum of authorities because already you have, you know, prior to that situation, you have armed group fighting where police can't even get close to these places. You have thousands of displaced people because of, of armed conflict. And police don't even, you know, give their, you know, weekly press conference anymore because they have nothing to say. And then suddenly you hear that, you know, the lead, you know, the president is, was assassinated last night and there was, and he, and he was tortured. He was, you know, cra like crazily beaten before getting killed. And there was not even a bullet shot from his security what is happening? Maya, you know, in addition to going into the presidential palace with, or the mansion rather, with the police, you guys went on a, a routine police operation with them as well to sort of see the uh, state of law and order at the moment and what was, what was happening. So Maya, what was it like to ride with police at a time when the security of the state is called quite into question by the toppling, the killing of the head of state? Yeah, it was, um, it's kind of, Extraordinary. Well, it's kind of surprising that in this absolutely extraordinary um, situation that is like the assassination of a president, you know, normal life keeps going and everyday crime continues. So we were in um, the Pétionville uh, police station and we were about to go on our embed and we luckily had our flax and our helmets on at, at the time, but this this shooting basically happened right outside the police station. Oh, wow. um, we were able to take cover um, and pretty quickly it turned out it was a robbery. And so we went along with the cops to sort of try on their investigation of what happened. And what they said they were going to do, it's, they called it a shakedown. We're going to go shake down the, um, the market. And that, that was really interesting because that's where Michael had this, what I thought was very like illuminating conversation with, with the police commissioner, where he said, the commissioner said, you know, people, you can tell when people are guilty because they're shaking. And so Michael asked him, well, isn't that possibly because they're afraid of the cops, of the police? And, and the commissioner said, well, they should be. And for, for too long, in Haiti, people haven't been afraid of the police. So you have a situation where sort of they're going for this low-hanging fruit, these everyday robberies, you know, they're hassling people in the market. But at the same time, you know, they're outgunned completely and outmanned by, you know, the gangs who are the real systemic security threat. And, you know, let's not forget the leader of, you know, the biggest gang coalition is himself an ex-cop. Um, so that whole experience sort of really brought into stark relief the situation, you know, with the police in Haiti and how out of their depth they are and, you know, what that means for the citizens who aren't being protected from the gangs by the police and who are also often victims, you know, of, of police harassment themselves. Right, and I think the coverage of this incident is a, in a larger context about how governments are serving their people across the world, right? Yeah, yeah. And this is an instance where the government was something that the people writ large was rejecting in certain ways. The president was trying to hold on to power. Now that power source is gone. In some ways, there's a vacuum of power. The police might not be the ones filling it. And that brings up Barbecue, yeah. the gang leader that you were able to spend so much time with. Right. 
And I think what I was struck by is like that moment where he's like, we don't have to hide our guns anymore. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, uh, we don't have to, we can operate as an open power source. Right. Uh, our, you know, might can be shown by our weaponry and like we're kind of in charge now. Yeah. What was it like talking to Barbecue? How did he get that name? It's actually just a tangential question. Sure, sure. But he seems yeah. like a very uh, in interesting character. Yeah. But then also a foreboding one as far as what peace and security might look like for people living in Haiti. So the name comes from uh, either one of two stories. And the first story is, is that uh, his mother was a, um, a street vendor who sold grilled chicken. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a lot of jimmies in the neighborhood. Uh, and so he was the one who went by barbecue because his mom uh, barbecued chicken. Yep. The other one, uh, the, the darker one, is that uh, barbecue has been implicated in uh, at least two massacres that have happened, uh, one of which in uh, the neighborhood of La Saline, which he now controls, mm -hmm. um, you know, dozens of people were killed, uh, their bodies were burnt, um, some of their bodies were eaten by stray dogs. Uh, it, you know, it's this, this really, really, really uh, terrible incident um, that, you know, it, it has kind of followed Barbecue and it has created his myth uh, as being this uh, notorious gang leader. Um, and like Maya said, former cop. I mean, 14 years as a cop, yep. you know, turned gang leader. And so he knows how the police work. And the area he controls, uh, you know, there's a, a police station right outside of it. Uh, and there, there are no cops knocking on his door trying to arrest him um, when, they, when they could. And, and the reason that they can is, you know, we, we, we spoke to one um, one officer who said that they're, I mean, they're flat out afraid. They don't have the arms to, to go after him and his gang. They don't have uh, the manpower to, to, to stop him. And, you know, there, there, there was always um, the sort of narrative that he was connected to President Moise. And so now, uh, in, in Moise's administration, and, you know, the U.S. sanctioned two of, uh, two members of, of Moise's administration for, um, for, for providing arms and, and, and weapons and, and financial support to Barbecue and, and his gangs to kind of snuff out the opposition that was, you know, kind of growing in La Saline. And so that's kind of where that connection comes from. And, you know, I, I think it's interesting, now that Moise is gone, it, it's really, it's really about up in the air of what Barbecue's future is gonna look like in Port-au-Prince. Is he going to continue to have the same clout, to have the same power, or you know, are are the Haitian people going to to elect someone that's you know not going to give him the kind of same reciprocity that he enjoyed with the Moise administration? Um, and so I, I think that's you know that's kind of too early to too early to tell. Sure, but at the at the moment he seems pretty like hey. At the moment he sees himself as a revolutionary force, and I think that that moment you're talking about hey we can bring out our guns now. He sees, or at least that's how he wanted to portray to journalists. Look, these aren't guns to you know to commit crimes. These are guns for the revolution uh, that he himself sees as as the leader of of that. And Jeremy, you, you are back in Port-au-Prince right now, I believe, and it's been a month. There's no clarity. Like, what what are people talking about? Are people kind of getting restless about there being no accountability? Uh, what are you hearing? I mean, the sentiment is uh, like every sort of almost every action taken already uh, at this point are not really heading in, in the direction to um, to find the real people behind uh, this crime. And the other side, you, they, it's anyone that can be really be useful to this investigation or getting attacked. Um, I, I mean, you just have a clerk of the judge that they just appointed to investigate um, what, um, what what happened. And um, uh, two days ago, this clerk uh, was found dead. And, wow. And when more people that's got, you know, get, that's are leading uh, this investigation are whether under threat, some already um, in hiding or people are dying. So this is, yeah, so this is really a very, a very um, um, scary and messy situation. And that doesn't bode well for the future of the stability of the country. Maya, I've got one last question for you, which is like, 
This is a story that's filled with surprises at every turn. What surprised you the most? <laughs> Other than the president being assassinated in his home. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think what surprised me the most genuinely this time around, I mean, we've talked about it already, but was just the lack of reaction on the streets, the calm. You know, last time we landed in, in Haiti, the first time we, we were there, we got off the plane and within sort of 10 minutes, there were sort of burning tires and we were in the middle of this, this huge protest. And I was expecting at least some sort of anger towards the, the, the systemic failure. And it just wasn't there and it's, and it's still not. I mean... The, the question for me is also, I don't know how, I think the reaction is different, has been different in other parts of Haiti, right, Jeremy, from other outside Port-au-Prince, um, you know, in, in um, Cap Haitien, where, where Moïse was from, during his, his, his um, funeral, there was a lot of, there were some protests. So Port-au-Prince does not make the, that country, but yeah, that, that lack of uh, feeling was, was surprising, for sure. Right, and it seems like that lack of healing or feeling is maybe related to just how much uncertainty there is. And I mean, Michael, I think if you could just sort of zoom out for us as we draw to a close, like Haiti is a very close neighbor to the United States. Uh, it's a very poor country. And it's one that has a direct connection to US foreign policy, to you know the legacy of colonialism, and to what we think of how states can fail, how they're set up to fail sometimes. And, how the poorest of the people can be the most vulnerable or the least served by their own governments. Like, what was it like for you reporting there as you have? What was it like for you to see this happen? And what does it make you feel about the future for the people of Haiti? I think what was so different this time is that when we would go out into the neighborhoods, people would come up to us. And because they didn't have the outlet of demonstrations and protests, you know, to express their anger, they would come up to us directly and express it. And not towards us, but seeing that we are, you know, a, um, so, someone, I guess, that could amplify, you know, what they're telling us. And so I felt this time, I, I saw that more, I felt that more, I felt the anger more. I mean, the anger was very visceral the last time, the first time we were there. But this time, um, there, was, there, there was like this underlying... Uh, foreboding, you know, feeling that something was very wrong and that people were extremely angry. And I got that sense. I mean, I, I think the whole team kind of felt that when we were there. And so going forward, I, you know, I, I, I know we're itching to get back. I know the team wants to get back down there and, and spend time with the people that we've developed these relationships with. Mm -hmm. Because I hate to say this, but I, it, it took the, the assassination of a president for the world to start focusing on Haiti again. Yeah. And every time the world focuses on Haiti, it's something terrible that's happening. But there's also some really beautiful things that are happening there. And I, you know, it, it, it's just, I mean, that, that's a byproduct of what we do, you and I do, what you know, Maya and Jeremy do, we're journalists, and oftentimes it's this, you know, this, this terrible news that gets highlighted. And um, you know, I, I think one thing that we've always tried to do with the films that we make when we go there is, you know, uh, bring the humanity out in it and bring the life out of it and bring the, you know, the, um, the culture out of it. And, you know, each time we go back, I hope that we can continue to do that because, you know, these are, these are people's lives, you know, and that's, you know, kind of our business. Right. So. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Jeremy and Maya. Uh, looking forward to more reporting from a place that seems to have some troubles, but a place that has some promise too, right? Yeah.